Well, good morning. Would you please turn in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 10? We're continuing this morning through Hebrews chapter 10. We'll be looking at verses 26 through 31. Uh, I just want to, again, personally encourage you and invite you uh, to the hymn sing on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Um, of course, we're trying to record the congregation singing together. And in order for us to really capture uh, the voice of ECC, the congregation, we really need to fill up this hall. So please mark that on your calendar. Make it a priority. Even if you think you're not a good singer uh, or that you don't have the best voice, but trust me, when you're singing in the company of God's people, it sounds beautiful. So come and sing unabashedly together uh, with us on Wednesday night. I also want to say, just as we begin <clears throat> this sermon, that uh, I took a commitment and a pledge, I made a commitment and a pledge to you when you called me to serve as your pastor. And that commitment and pledge was to not shrink back from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Some things in God's word are heavy and hard. And for me to not say those things to you would be unloving. And I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that I love you. And I consider it a privilege to serve you uh, as a shepherd of this flock and to preach God's word to you. And so I will not shrink back from declaring to you what God's holy and inspired word says. Would you join me in prayer one more time? Heavenly Father, our gracious God, we come to you, Lord, in fear and trembling, knowing that you are the living God, that you are our creator, our Lord, and our judge. And as we hear what your word has to say this morning, I pray that our hearts would be soft that we would flee for refuge to our Lord Jesus Christ, apart from whom we have no hope. It's in his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> you know, one of the signs that you're growing older is when you listen to people talk, the younger people talk, and then you don't understand what they say. Social media is really begun to change the way that we speak, especially with what they call Generation Z. So I've learned a few new phrases listening to these folks talk. One of these, for example, is wig. It's really wig. Maybe you don't know what that means. I just learned that that means, oh, I really like this, it's great. It blows my wig away. <laughs> uh, the other is, you know, similar. Uh, that was a real W. I didn't know what that means. It means that was a real win. That was great. Here's one that, you know, you might completely misunderstand. It's, it's like saying, you know, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to go over to their house and I'm going to just sip tea. So I thought, okay, you're going to someone's house and you're going to have a cup of tea with them. No, that's not what it means. It means that there's a conflict or some kind of gossip going on and you're staying out of it and sipping tea. Here's another one that I learned fairly recently, ghosting, you know, oh man, that guy just ghosted me. I had no idea what this means. I kept hearing people say ghosting, but apparently ghosting someone means that you're in touch with them on social media, that you're having, you know, these chats or you're uh, having a conversation. And all of a sudden they just stop messaging you. They cut off all communication. You never hear from them again, no matter how much you try to reach them, they're unresponsive. And they've completely disappeared from the, your life. They ghosted you. Do you know that also happens sometimes with the church? That people ghost the church. That's what had taken place in the first century in this church to which the author of Hebrews was speaking, the, the ones that received this letter. Some of these individuals, members of the church even, were facing persecution. They, they knew that following Christ and gathering with the church meant that 
they could possibly be arrested or even put to death. And so they abandoned it. They ghosted the church. Not realizing that they were ghosting Christ himself. And they were trying to go back to the old covenant law. And here's the thing, friends. This still happens today. It's a common thing that people ghost the church. They suddenly vanish as the cares of this life and the temptations of this world and the ease of convenience draw their hearts away from Christ and his people. Well, today's text, the author tells us what happens to those who ghost the church. And dear friends, brothers and sisters, as we look at this passage of scripture, we should grow alarmed and terrified at the frightful prospect of judgment that we will face should we abandon our confession and our commitment to gathering with God's people. You know, the author of Hebrews, as I've said, has laid out for us much theology over several chapters. Chapters 7 to 10, he's shown us that we have in Christ a better priest who offers a better sacrifice, who has gained entry into a better sanctuary, the presence of God in heaven itself, and who has inaugurated a better covenant into which he brings us. And then last week we saw that the author is moving from theology to application, from doctrine to duty. In other words, because Jesus is better, this then is how you should live. That's what he laid out for us last week as he commanded us to draw near to God, to be committed to drawing near to God in worship, to be com committed in holding firmly our confession, and to not neglect the gathering of ourselves together, but encouraging one another. Well, this week, he is showing us what happens should we fail in that duty. Should we neglect and abandon the duty to which Christ has called us. So with that, let's read the text. Let me read this for you. Hebrews 10, 26. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified? and has outraged the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine. I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Wow. Wow. God's word does not hold back. As we think of the weight and seriousness of that warning, we recognize this is a supremely sobering warning. So as we look at this, we, I want to ask three questions of the text as I unfold this passage, as we look together and see what God's word is saying to us. First, what is the sin that is being warned against? What is the sin that we are being warned not to commit? Notice again verses 26 and 27. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. And when we read a warning like that with such a strong judgment, and we hear the phrase that if we go on sinning deliberately, 
You know, we might think of certain big sins, right? The, what we categorize in our mind as those awful sins. Maybe he's speaking about the sin of murder. Or maybe he's speaking of the sin of adultery or of embezzlement. Maybe he's talking about the sin of blaspheming God's name. But I want you to notice one little word there in the text that tells us, shows us clearly what the author is saying. Did you notice the word for? For, at the beginning of verse 26. For, if we go on sinning deliberately. And the word for means because. It means that there is a logical link between what the author is saying now and the verses that precede what he is saying now. What has he just said in verse 25? In verse 25, he has admonished these people saying, consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Look at your Bible. Not neglecting to meet together. Or as some translations put it, not neglecting the assembling of ourselves together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as the day draws near. He's told them before that, that we must hold fast our confession, that we must draw near to God. So in other words, the sin here is an abandonment of those duties that we see in verses 19 to 25 and in verse 25 especially. The sin here is the sin of abandoning our confession, which is the truth we believe, which is itself an abandonment of Christ. And specifically, specifically that forsaking of Christ takes place through forsaking Christ's community, the church. Let us not neglect the assembling of ourselves together. Let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as is the habit of some. The habitual non-attendance in worship is what the author is warning against. The, the logic is very clear it's it's straightforward there not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near and he is speaking dear friends of judgment day and then he says as, as judgment day draws near don't make it a habit of neglecting to meet together because if you go on sinning deliberately there will be a fearful expectation of judgment that you will face do you follow the logic there he is warning against the sin of apostasy. Apostasy is a departure from Christ, a departure from faith in Christ. But that departure from Christ is visible in one's failure to draw near in corporate worship. The departure from Christ is visible when one departs from assembling together with the church in our neglect a habitual neglect of gathered worship. That answers our first question. What is the sin that the author is warning against? Second question, which is probably even raised in your heart and mind right now. Why is this sin so serious? Why is this sin so serious? Again, notice that the author says... If we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Now, the phrase there, sinning deliberately, is made clearer in light of the Old Testament's teaching on different categories of sin. If you go back and read the book of Leviticus, if you read the book of Numbers, especially chapter 15, I believe, uh, there is a distinction made under the Old Covenant between sins that were unintentional and sins that were heavy-handed or deliberate, sins that were done with a high hand. 
when the Old Testament speaks of unintentional sins, there always are sacrifices that could be offered for those sins. Those were sins that a person commits. Maybe they didn't even realize it. We all sin in many ways. We all stumble. We all fall short. And then the person comes under conviction of sin. There's a repentance involved. They come to the Lord. They offer sacrifices and they're forgiven. When it speaks of heavy-handed, high-handed, deliberate sin, it's the kind of sin where the person says, I know what God commands. I know what his word says. I know that there's this covenant and that there are punishments that God will inflict upon me or whatever, but I don't believe, I just cast it off and I'm just going to do what I want. It's the sin of apostasy, of throwing off the covenant, of throwing off God's authority and doing what you want. And here, the author is likening our departure from the people of God, our habitual forsaking of the assembly, which is a forsaking of Christ, in this category of sin. Deliberate high-handed sin. If you depart from Jesus, in other words, there will be no forgiveness, no sacrifice for you. If you abandon the assembling of Jesus' people together, that constitutes a forsaking of Christ himself. And there will be no sacrifice or forgiveness of sins for you. And he says, consider this, that you have come to the knowledge of the truth. Over several chapters, the author has presented to us Christ. He's shown us that Jesus is our only hope. He is the great high priest. He's the only one through whom we can draw near to God. He is the perfect sacrifice. He's the only one whose blood can cleanse our consciences. He's the only one through whom we can approach God and receive forgiveness of sins. And he's told us in light of who Jesus is, in light of what Jesus has done, this is how you should live. And now you know what God demands. You know what God calls you to do, what God calls us to do. And at this point, if we choose to neglect that, there will be no return. That's what the author is saying. There will be no return. This would constitute deliberate, heavy-handed sin. Remember again, he's commanded us to draw near in worship, to hold firmly our confession of faith, the truth we believe, and to live in Christian community with one another. To not neglect our assembling together with the church, this gathering. In other words, the author is saying to us, when you turn your back on Christ and abandon the faith, by abandoning his church, by neglecting his gathering, you are guilty of this sin. And, and look at how he sets forth the seriousness of, of what we're doing when we do that, right? Listen, listen to verse 29. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? When you forsake the assembling of the saints together and don't live in Christian community, when you turn your back on Jesus, this is what you're doing. Number one, you are trampling underfoot the Son of God. That's a shocking phrase. It means you put your foot upon Christ like you walk on the mud. Ever had a cockroach roaming around in your house and you just feel disgusted and you go and step on it? You're treating Christ the Son of God himself, like a common cockroach or worm, trampling him underfoot. It says that we profane the blood of the covenant by which we are sanctified. The, the phrase there means you're treating the blood of Christ as something that is filthy, unclean, something common. And, and the irony, remember, the blood of Christ is the only thing that can cleanse us. 
The blood of Christ is what sanctifies us, cleanses us from all our sin, purifies us, brings us to God. And here the author says, when you sin in this way, it's like tossing the blood of Jesus into the garbage, treating it like spoiled milk. Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. His death paid the penalty for sins. When we sin in this way, we are saying that his death is worthless, of no value, that his crucifixion was like a killing of a common criminal. We trample underfoot the Son of God. We profane the blood of the covenant. And third, look at what he says, we outrage the spirit of grace. It's an insult, a mockery of the Holy Spirit. That's what the phrase means. It means that you're mocking the Spirit until he is outraged. It means that you insult him, mock him, dishonor him. The phrase refers to the, the kind of outrage one would be feeling when you spit upon their face. You're looking at the Holy Spirit and saying, I don't need you, and outraging him. That's how serious the sin is. Brothers and sisters, consider the logic of the word of God here. Forsaking the assembly, habitual neglect of gathered worship is no small thing. It is serious. You know, Earl Blackburn in his uh, little tract, Church Attendance, Is It Important?, this is a very good tract. I believe they give it out uh, at the church in Dubai. He lays out several reasons why church attendance is important and what is communicated by a habitual neglect of worship, what takes place when we habitually neglect the gathering of the saints. I'm going to lay out 11 of these for you. First is this. When you hab habitually neglect the gathering of God's people, it reveals a, a cold heart and a lack of fervent love to Christ who himself instituted this gathering, who purchased us with his blood. Second, it, it shows a casual disregard for the clear commandment, the clear and direct commandment of God. Friends, it couldn't be any clearer. God's word is so clear at this point. Not neglecting, not neglecting to meet together, not neglecting the assembling of ourselves together. That's referring to this meeting. And it's emphasized to don't neglect this. And when we neglect it, it's... Shrugging off God's clear and direct command. No, gathered worship is not optional for Christians, brothers and sisters. Whoever gave you that idea, let me disabuse you of that idea right now. Third, you miss out by neglecting the gathering of the saints. You miss out on God's primary design for your spiritual growth and well-being. It robs you of his blessing and help for days ahead. Remember, he says, the day is drawing near. This is what prepares us to meet him. You miss out, reason number four, you miss out on a foretaste of heaven. We'll see in Hebrews chapter 12 that when we come to this assembly, that we're coming to the heavenly city, Zion. Heaven touches earth in this assembly. I'm not making that up. That's what the author of Hebrews says in chapter 12. And we miss out on that foretaste of heaven. What do you think we'll be doing in heaven forever and ever and ever? Just read Revelation chapter 5. We'll be gathered together with God's people from every tribe and tongue and nation, worshiping him together. And we miss out on the foretaste of that when we miss out on this assembly. Next, it robs your brothers and sisters of the blessing and encouragement that you should bring to them by your presence. Remember the logic of chapter 10 verse 25? Don't neglect to meet together, but encourage one another. Your presence here on Sunday morning on the Lord's Day is meant to encourage other believers. And when you neglect it, it discourages them. Next reason, it grieves, insults, and even outrages the Holy Spirit. 
That's clear in the text. Also, it grieves the elders who oversee you and who will give an account for your soul. Did you know that? The Bible says that you are to obey your leaders and submit to them in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them for they keep watch over your souls as those who have to give an account. This is why we emphasize the importance of church membership, brothers and sisters, because we have to give an account for your souls. And we want to know who you are. And then when you don't show up, how are we going to shepherd you? It grieves us. Do you know that? Nothing hurts me. As a pastor, this is one of the most hurtful things to me as a pastor. When I see a dear brother or sister, a member of the flock, whom God has committed to our care, begin to ghost the church and not show up. Next reason why this is serious. It influences others by your bad example to become unfaithful and indifferent. They say, oh, brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so, they don't come. They're going and doing this on Sunday morning. It's no big deal if I don't come. It spreads. Next, it makes you a covenant breaker in your commitment to God and the local church in which he placed you. It makes you a covenant breaker in your commitment to God and the church in which he placed you. Our covenant that we have made together as members of this church, point number two says we will gather together regularly. And when you don't come, you're breaking that covenant. Habitual non-attendance is covenant breaking. Tenth reason, and, and this is one of the most important. Pay attention to this one. It is a poor testimony to non-Christians. It is a poor testimony to non-Christians. You think about our Muslim friends. If you have a Muslim friend who never goes to his prayers, what do you begin to assess about him? He's it's not really serious about his religion. He's... He's nominal. What do you think it says to your non-Christian friends when you don't show up when the church gathers to worship Christ? It shows what you value the most. It tells them that there is something else in my life in this world that is more valuable than worshiping Christ with his people. Listen to what Jared Wilson says. Listen to these words. What we spend our time on shows what we truly value. If you miss church in order to sleep in or to attend a sporting activity or any other hobby, what does this say about the worth you ascribe to God? Replacing your church's regularly scheduled worship time with some other activity demonstrates that God is not actually worthy of our worship. Something else is. Unfortunately, this is the attitude and conduct of unbelievers, not of God's people. And then final reason why this is so serious. It is a dreadful step on the road to apostasy. It is a dreadful step as you begin to habitually neglect gathered worship. That is a dreadful step on the road to apostasy, which is a road that leads to hell. Brothers and sisters, what is this sickness that grips evangelical Christians today? That causes them to think, I don't need to be a member of the church no big deal. Or I can miss worship even habitually, come when I want, and it's no big deal. What is the sickness that grips us, that makes us think in those ways? You know, I was talking to uh, one uh, person this week, and uh, the sister said to me, uh, you know, Pastor, I, I think it's this mindset that people think, oh, God is everywhere. I can worship him anywhere I want. I don't need to be a part of the church or have to go to worship to do that. It's just my private relationship with God. I can worship Him anywhere. Or maybe people think, well, God is gracious. He's full of grace and mercy. He's not going to place demands upon us like that. 
Or maybe as one person once said, you think God will forgive me. That's his job. Friend, if that, those are your ideas, then may I humbly submit to you that you have reinvented God in your mind and that you are following a God of your own imaginings, not the God of the Bible. A God who says, come and do whatever you want, wherever you want, who places no demands, is not the God of the Bible. I want to also speak to you. Maybe you're thinking, well, this is not me. I'm here, right? Look, I'm here. I'm here every week. I'm safe, right? That's not me. But let me remind you what he said. He said, we are to draw near in worship with a sincere heart. So it doesn't matter if you're here every week, if your heart is not here. If you're coming here with a long face and then using the sermon time to catch up on the sleep you missed the night before because you were watching Netflix or whatever else. If you're here and you're grumpy about being here and you don't recognize how important this is and how vital this is to your life, friends, that's not sincerity, that's pretense. If you're here and you're passive and you don't participate at all, come in, go out, done. I don't want to know anybody and I don't want to be known by anybody. You're not fulfilling what he called us to do. He says, consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. Encourage one another. That's the purpose of our gathering. Active participation. So this would apply to you too. Let's answer an important question. Are there legitimate reasons to miss gathered worship? Because I was asked this. Is it always a sin? Are there legitimate reasons to miss gathered worship? And I say, yes. Of course there are legitimate reasons that you would miss the assembly of God's people. Uh, I would put those under the category of being providentially hindered. Right? This is how Christians have always viewed it. It's, it's a classical way of speaking. If It is all right to miss the gathering if we are providentially hindered. In other words... God in his sovereign wisdom has ordered the circumstances of your life one particular week or day such that because of things outside your control, you couldn't come. All right? Providentially hindered for gathering. So let me give you a few examples. Let's say that you're sick or you have an infectious disease. Then obviously you shouldn't come. You don't want to make others sick and infect others with the disease. All right? Encourage one another, not infect one another. Okay. A sickness or an infectious disease. Maybe you're bedridden. You know, there are saints, especially older saints, who are bedridden, who are not able to come out. I've, I've seen, though, you know, I, I remember worshiping at a church where a brother who was near 90, who was a double amputee in both legs, would still have members of the church pick him up so that he could be there in worship, in his wheelchair, every week, every single week, till he could no longer move. If you're bedridden, or if you're caring for someone who is bedridden, right? You're caring for aged parents, and you can't leave their side, then that's understandable. Or if you have a personal or family emergency, something happens, you need to go to the hospital, wife goes into labor, you're going to have a child. And I missed worship on the day that Eliana was born, right? Mishika went into labor in the middle of the night, and I missed worship that Sunday morning. Right? A personal or family emergency. Or if there's a natural disaster, all of a sudden there's an earthquake or a flood with, you know, the flood waters are filling the streets, so there's no way to go out of your house. A snowstorm that snows people in, which doesn't happen in Abu Dhabi, but other things could happen. A sandstorm that you, you can't see. A yeah, natural disaster. But those are prov providentially ordered reasons that you might miss worship. But some people ask, but what, what, Pastor, what about vacation? And I want to ask, you're going to take a vacation from God? Of course, you take a vacation from work. But wherever you're going on vacation, make sure that you gather with the saints at a local church there. In fact, I don't know, I mean, don't you do this? Like before you travel to a place on vacation, you look up, where can I attend church with my family? I know one pastor, uh, uh, Anand Samuel, who says he always picks if, where he's going on vacation. If he's going for more than two weeks, he'll make sure that there's a healthy local church there where the gospel is preached before he goes. What about travel? 
Again, I would submit to you and encourage you, try to travel in such a way, order your travel in such a way that you don't miss worship. Either travel and arrive before over here, or if you're going somewhere else, make sure you travel after you attend worship. It's simple. It's not that complicated, you know. Now, you, maybe your flight gets delayed and you get stranded in an airport somewhere. That would be being providentially hindered. Brothers and sisters, this is so important. I want to speak to parents here. Oftentimes, parents will come to me and, you know, they'll talk about where the kid is going off to college. But you should be thinking about the local church and whether there's a strong local church there before you make the decision. In fact, you should. This is what I'll do with my kids. Before we pick a university, we're going to shortlist all the places that have healthy local churches that preach the gospel where they can grow spiritually and then pick where they're going to study. Isn't this more important? Isn't our spiritual life far more important than our career? And again, you might be here and say to me, you don't understand my situation. Like I said last week, again, think of these people. They were at risk of imprisonment or death for following Christ publicly, for gathering with the church. And that's why they were beginning to shrink back. And God tells them, don't neglect this. I may not understand your situation and I really truly want you want to. Whether that's a tough boss at work, but there I would say, fear God rather than fear man. And I want to say to you, the Lord understood your situation when by the Holy Spirit he inspired these commands in his word and he commanded us to draw near and not to neglect his assembly. Dear brothers and sisters, I'm, I'm, I'm pleading, I want to ask you, why do we think this is such a casual thing? Do we really believe that we can flippantly or casually disregard the Lord and not pay the price? And as your pastor, I love you too much to let you do that. I love you too much to let you do that without warning you. And I want to encourage you to love one another and other members of this church enough so that you warn them and caution them. Because the consequences are severe. The consequences are are not light. You see? That leads to our third question. We've asked what the sin is, and I've answered abandoning Christ, which is seen in abandoning the gatherings of his church. We've seen why the sin is so serious. It tramples underfoot the Son of God and mocks God himself. Now we ask and answer question three. What are the consequences of this sin? What are the consequences of this sin? Did you see what the text says in verse 27? It says there's a fearful, that word can be translated, a terrifying, in some translations it's translated, a terrifying expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. In other words, when you go on committing this sin, you become an adversary, an enemy of God. And there will be a terrifying judgment that comes upon you and a fury of fire that consumes. You know, the author is using the symbolic language of fire and you might think, oh, fire, that's symbolic. That's not real. So it can't be that bad. But I want to tell you that correct interpretation will show you that when there's a symbol for something, the reality is far greater He's using the symbol of a furious fire to describe something far worse. He's talking about the eternal fire of hell. And, and as you hear that, you might say, oh, the author of Hebrews, I don't think Jesus talks like that. Jesus is meek and gentle and gracious and merciful. But let me remind you, dear friends, that Jesus talked about hell more than any other person in the New Testament. He tells us in Matthew 10, 28, that we ought to fear the one who has the power to destroy both body and soul in hell. And you might think, oh, this is just destruction. It's annihilation, right? We just go out of existence. And if you have that idea, let me tell you that that's false. It is eternal punishment. Jesus speaks very clearly about that as well. He says, their worm does not die and the fire is never quenched or put out. 
In other words, hell is this state of existence in which you are eternally being devoured, but never completely destroyed. You are eternally in anguish, and there is no relief. Why is the punishment so severe? Look again at the logic of verses 28 and 29. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? The author is making an argument there from lesser to greater. He's talking about the punishments that existed under the old covenant. Under the old covenant... If you broke God's law and committed certain sins, those sins were punishable by death. There was the death penalty. And again, that is speaking of a physical, earthly death. In the new covenant, the penalty is much higher. Of course, we can illustrate this, can't we? This argument, this logic. Imagine you don't like this sermon, and I imagine some of you feel very uncomfortable with this, and maybe you meet me outside in the courtyard, and I say hello, and you say, I just hate that sermon, spit on my face. Um, I don't think much will happen. I'll feel hurt, but you drive away home unharmed, all right? And maybe imagine if on your way home, you're stopped by the police, and the police wants to ask you some questions, and you lower your window and say, get out of my face, the consequence would be higher. Imagine you're summoned in to meet one of the ruling authorities of this nation, and you go in and he offers you his hand and you... You would be shot before you even do that. Same, same action, different result, because the authority you have sinned against is higher. That's the argument that the author is utilizing here. The law of Moses was an inferior revelation compared to what we have received in the new covenant in Christ. There were earthly punishments for disobeying that law. When we violate the new covenant, the punishment is eternal because we have sinned against one who is far, far greater. Jesus is better and therefore the punishment for sinning against him is greater. Look at verses 30 to 31. The seriousness of the punishment. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Friends, this is not a game. This is the most terrifying reality in the universe. The judgment that is threatened here is inexpressible in its terror and in its fear. All happiness, all joy, All hopes, all comfort, all relief will be forever removed. And the only thing you will face is the vengeance of an almighty, infinite, omnipotent, sovereign God inflicted upon you forever. And the inevitable certainty of eternal punishment depends here in this text upon God's own holy character and judgment. He promises it. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. And as one author says, the final sentence. Did you see the final sentence there? It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The final sentence is chilling in its simplicity. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Maybe you're here this morning. And you don't know Christ. Dear non-Christian friend, I want to speak to you. I want to plead with you that apart from Christ, you will face this judgment. You will face the judgment and vengeance of Almighty God for your sins. You will fall into the hands of the living God. So I plead with you. We plead with you to repent of your sin and to trust in Christ, to flee to Christ. You only have these two options. Either Christ is your sacrifice for your sins or you face 
God's judgment. You see, Jesus himself, the Son of God, went through this judgment for all who believe in him. He fell into the hands of the living God on the cross. He endured the wrath and vengeance of Almighty God for our sins, for those who trust him. And if you're here this morning, you won't have to face that judgment if you put your faith in Christ, if you repent from your sins and flee to this Savior and have him as your sacrifice. Maybe you think it's no big deal what you believe concerning God or how you live, but we want to caution you, hell is real and judgment is coming. And on that day, it won't matter what you think. All that will matter is the reality of the living God who says, vengeance is mine and I will repay. But, brothers and sisters, remember again the context of Hebrews. These warnings, this warning, is not written, was not originally written to non-Christians. It's not written to our friends here in Abu Dhabi this morning who are out in the mall or somewhere else. It's not written to non-Christians even in this room. These warnings are written to believers. Did you see what he says there? Again, he says, the Lord will judge his people. The passage here in Hebrews is a warning to Christians. Remember the context of Hebrews, that members of the church had begun forsaking the assembling of the saints. Out of fear of persecution and affliction, they were fleeing from the church, from Christ, and going back to Judaism. And so this warning is saying to believers who neglect the gathering of themselves together, who are drifting in their faith, that they will face the consequences of eternal judgment and punishment if they continue down that road. In fact, all of Hebrews, the message of the entirety of Hebrews, is one big warning. Don't fall away. So that, of course, leads to the major theological question then, right? Can true believers lose their salvation? I know that that question comes up. By the way, if, if you want more instruction on this, you can go and listen to the sermon I preached on Hebrews 6, verses 4 to 8. I cover these things there. I'll repeat them in brief here. To the question, can true believers lose their salvation? I would answer, no. We are safe in God's hands. Jesus says in John chapter 10, My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hands. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Brothers and sisters, our salvation is secure by the power of God, by God's unbreakable promises. Our eternal destiny is firmly established by the perfect high priestly ministry of Jesus, the Son of God. All true believers will persevere to the end. They will be preserved by God himself till the end. So then the question comes, and why the warning? Why all this rigmarole? Well, God puts these warnings in his word for his excellent and wise purposes. He puts them there to keep you from falling away. The way that God preserves us from falling away is by using warnings and showing us what would happen if we do fall away. Do you understand? And so two two things are true at once. One is that all true believers are safe and secure and God will preserve them till the end. But number two, true believers must be warned against departing from Christ, against abandoning the church. And God uses these warnings to keep us in the faith. It's, it's like when you're walking around along a mountain cliff and you see a warning sign which says danger, steep precipice or steep drop. And that keeps you away from that edge. As Spurgeon so beautifully put it, God says, my child, if you fall over this cliff, you will be dashed to pieces. What does the child do? He says, father, keep me. Hold me up and I shall be safe. It leads the believer to a greater dependence on God, to a holy fear and caution. Then you ask the question, what about those who do depart from the faith, who fall away, who don't persevere? Well, to that we would answer, they were never truly saved in the first place. 1 John 2.19 says, those who went out from us were never really off us, because if they were off us, they would have stayed with us. So, brothers and sisters, we must hold fast our confession of faith. 
And let us prepare for judgment day by not neglecting this assembly. Remember what we said last week, our meetings on the Lord's day prepare us to meet the Lord. I do want to call our attention to a point of application for our particular congregation. I hope you have a members directory, dear members of the church. If you don't, you should get one if you're a member. And we have this extended section at the end called Members in Absentia. And many of these are those who have ghosted the church, who are forsaking the assembly. And I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, to reach out to them, to warn them, to caution them, to call them back. The issue is if they are willfully neglecting this visible earthly assembly, that's a sign that they might be excluded from the heavenly assembly and fall into the hands of the living God and face this judgment that we've been seeing. I also want to share with you, our elders have been speaking about this and thinking through this, that we must, out of love, out of love, we must practice church discipline for the sin of habitual, persistent non-attendance. This doesn't mean you get discipline if you miss worship once or twice. No, but after many warnings, after much pursuit, after calling people back, if they continue to forsake the assembling of the saints, wouldn't it be unloving to just let them continue in that fashion? It's far better to receive church discipline and be warned on earth than to fall into the hands of the divine judge and be condemned from heaven. A church that does not discipline is a church that does not love because it does not love enough to tell the truth. And a pastor who doesn't warn and rebuke is a pastor who does not love. And I refuse to be that kind of a pastor. Brothers and sisters, there is grace in Christ. Grace that is greater than all our sin. And he who shed his blood for you is ready to welcome you back this morning if you will flee your sin and run into his arms and resolve to live for him. You know, in the 1985, the New York Times published an article about uh, a party of lifeguards at the community pool of New Orleans. And these lifeguards, uh, 200 of them, were gathered at the pool there, this community pool, to celebrate the first summer, the first summer in which there had not been a single drowning. The 200 lifeguards had a great party, and then the party was finished, and people were going home, and at the end of the party, four of them saw in the deep end of the pool a body fully clothed. And they tried to revive this man, Robert Moody, who was 31 years old, but he was dead. And he had drowned in a party surrounded by lifeguards. Now we're celebrating 50 years. We're giving thanks to God for many things. We're very thankful and excited about a lot of things. But let's be sure, brothers and sisters, that while we're busy doing that, that people don't face a fury of fire. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. With fear and trembling, we submit to your word. And by your spirit, we pray that you would work in us that which is pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name.